Welcome everyone, and we would like to thank you for joining this webinar. I see a couple of people still joining. It's all good. Great you're all here. And we're happy to be presenting this new market-based measures accounting framework to accelerate transport decarbonization. Um, just for your information, uh, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be made available after uh, the presentation. Welcome to the people who are still joining. Great you, you're all here. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A section uh, where your questions will be answered uh, as well. Uh, we have an open section midway the webinar where you can ask your questions. And we also have a section at the end of the webinar where there will also be the opportunity to raise any questions um, you may have. Without further ado, before going into the actual um, framework, let me tell you a little bit more about Smart Freight Center. So to give you first like a brief introduction of the organization, we are a global nonprofit organization focused on reducing the carbon footprint of the logistics sector. Our vision is an efficient and zero emission global logistic and freight sector. Uh, we try to achieve this by first actually enabling companies to calculate their GHG emissions to ultimately drive transparency and accountability of organizations and to achieve any significant impact. Collaboration is key uh, where we collaborate with our global partners to share knowledge and best practice. And additionally, we provide companies with education and training to help them accelerate the uptake of decarbonization solutions. Um, this is really it in a nutshell, but if you'd like to know more about our programs and projects, please have a look at our website. To tell you a little bit more about the planning and the speakers today, uh, we'll have two speakers, um, SFC Program Director Dan Smith, We'll provide an overview of the framework. <clears throat> but before we get to that, uh, Margie van Gogh from World Economic Forum will share some remarks to set the context for why this work is important. Uh, Margie leads the supply chain and transport initiatives at the World Economic Forum and is a member of the global industries team. Um, these initiatives aim to accelerate pathways for resilient, sustainable, and inclusive supply system solutions. Uh, the supply chain and transport initiatives allow the creation of multi-stakeholder collaborations across the industry value chains and these are focused on collective action and accelerating digital and energy transformation through harnessing shared data technology and renewable zero emission energy initiatives i'm uh, very glad you're joining us today margie and um please the floor is all yours well, thank, thank you so much, and, and, and thank you so much to every partner that's joined us um, today, but particularly those that have been on this journey with the team at the Smart Trade Center, um, Dan, Alan, um, Christoph's broader team, everybody that has worked so hard to uh, realize this framework today. So absolutely thrilled to be here thrilled to see this realized um, and just wanted to share just a few words about um, the inception and some of you uh, dialing in today will have been part of that and in fact uh, there are a couple of you that are very instrumental in what we've been able to achieve. Um, for those of you that don't know the forum really engages you know foremost political business um, cultural uh, leaders of society to 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 respond to and shape uh, how we are responding to some of the big systemic challenges that we are facing. And uh, we've been doing this for uh, plus five decades. Our activities really are shaped by um, quite a unique culture that has been founded on stakeholder theory. And this framework is an illustration of how that truly works in action. So I'll just share with you a little bit of a uh, little bit of the history in uh, early. Well, it was actually late 2020. Um, some discussions with uh, with one of our partners, a global leader in this space. Um, and that has been really instrumental in, in, in driving the concept of how do we 
maximize the opportunity to accelerate the adoption of new fuels um, and thereby there is a necessity to minimize the fragment fragmentation that we see very often in our um, in our supply chain transport logistics sector because large parts of it are unregulated and um, regulation uh, then requires uh, or lack of regulation then requires industry you know to really have a cohesive and aligned approach if we want to respond to some of the bigger challenges that we are faced with and the <clears throat> the discussion led to how can we bring this uh, to the agenda of the CEO community that the World Economic Forum convenes, um, supply chain transport leaders, global global practices, as well as um, organizations that are uh, focused on, you know, horizon scanning and consultancy and uh, technical development. Of course, the Smart Rate Center is a fantastic partner to have here. And um, and what transpired was early in 21, a conversation between the CEOs of a number of large global logistics players across uh, modes that uh, identified the need for a more cohesive um, approach to a rather complex problem of how do we ensure that shippers can get uh, or be credited for um, for in essence, agreeing to ship perhaps in a, a more expensive um, mode of adopting sustainable fuels early on uh, where they're available, but they won't be all over the globe. And that discussion translated into an endorsement from the CEO group for us to go ahead and investigate how together with a partner group, we might launch an initiative that would enable us to develop a, a book and claim registry or a system where um, there is more cohesion, um, but a common approach across modes of transport that would enable shippers then to essentially um, become part of the sustainable logistics journey well in advance of uh, the scaling of those fuels. And so what we have here today is really an example of true um, multi-stakeholder collaboration. And I'm not going to speak much longer because I think uh, it's really it's really important that we understand this framework, which really represents a very innovative solution, um, relatively straightforward accounting model. But again, when shippers, be they customers of yours, global corporates, or actually us as individuals, want to make a choice about ensuring that we are contributing in some small or even larger way, we need to have the mechanisms to do that. And a sustainable global economy um, in the face of, you know, rising climate risk is just simply not thinkable without sustainable logistics supply chain solutions. And I certainly believe that this framework provides us with an opportunity to advance um, investments in adoption of and scaling of sustainable logistics solutions. So I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in this from very early on in the journey to where we are now. And now the, um, the climb only begins now. With a framework that we all feel we can adopt, I think it's fundamentally important that we also try to do so in a cohesive way and try to avoid the dilution effect that will come from multiple standards. So thrilled to be here with this group today. Um, thank you so much uh, for all the hours that have been put into this in deliberation. It's not an easy topic. I think some of you will uh, will have spent many hours debating this to get to the point where we are now. And with your inputs, we are where we are now. So thank you so much. And um, particularly to our partners in developing the solution, the Smart Trade Center. Thank you, um, Ellen, Dan, and the team. Um, phenomenal work. Thank you very much. Great, Margie. Appreciate the the time and, and your contributions and partnership and support on, on this project and also setting the stage for us. Uh, on why we're here today. Marilyn, are you willing to jump ahead to the next uh, the next slide? Thanks. So 
I'm going to build a little bit on the on the context that uh, that Margie presented from the forum perspective, just with a brief timeline of how we SFC got to where we are today and where, more importantly, arguably, we were last week with the re release of this framework. So our work at Smart Freight Center uh, on insetting really started three years ago when we partnered with DPDHL in the development of a white paper, a concept paper that outlined at a theoretical level how this idea of the freight transportation inset might work. There's a fair amount of interest in that work and in the concept and in moving that concept from concept phase into application, specifically with respect to sustainable aviation fuel or SAF and air transportation supply chains. So moving from fall of 2020, publication of the white paper to summer of 2021, where we partnered with MIT Center for Transport and Logistics in the release, the publication of this SAF insetting guidelines that explain how to apply the insetting model, the insetting principle to decarbonization of air transportation supply chains with SAF. And those SAF insetting guidelines were incidentally based on a book and claim chain of custody approach. Having completed the SAF insetting guidelines in the summer 2021, as Margie indicated, we were getting interest from stakeholders in, well, what about other modes of transportation? And what about organizations who have um, not only a specific mode that they're working with, but who have multimodal transportation supply chains? And can we take those SAF principles, the insetting principles that were outlined in the SAF guidelines and build on those into a multimodal framework? And that's was uh, the, the timing was serendipitous in Margie's group hearing about the interest from the CEO level, us hearing at the staff level from stakeholders about their need for an accounting framework that address multiple modes of transportation. And that's when we launched this uh, multimodal project. With a diverse uh, technical working group representing um, uh, entities across the transportation sector. We went through the development of a draft of the multimodal accounting framework, which went out for public 30-day uh, public comment period last spring. During the summer of last year, we revised that draft um, and produced another draft that we circulated to a smaller group around uh, meetings and work at Climate Week in, uh, in uh, New York last year. We then piloted that climate week draft of the framework starting last fall with the pilots running into the early part of this year. And much of the spring of this year, we spent revising the framework yet again, based on the feedback that we received um, from the pilots. And that feedback, those revisions, this iterative process is what led us to the launch and the release of the multimodal project uh, that we published uh, last week on the SFC website. Um, next slide, please, uh, if you would, Marilyn. So, yeah, wh why did we start all of this stuff back in 2020? Why is insetting even a thing? Well, we at Smart Freight Center had heard, and it's been our experience, that um, we got a lot going on in freight transportation supply chains. And when I say a lot going on, really what I want to focus on here is three things. We have organizations with very large, complex, and dynamic supply chains when it comes to the movement of, of freight. You might have, for example, a shipper who is contracted with hundreds, if not thousands, of freight carriers and freight forwarders in the transportation or uh, to meet their transportation service needs. In many cases, a shipper or forwarder doesn't even know the actual transportation asset that is ultimately moving a parcel or uh, um, a package on their behalf. And these complex uh, supply chains are shifting. It's not necessarily like a carrier is always and forever subcontracted to specific forwarder or shipper. That's important because it means that it can be very difficult for a shipper or a freight forwarder or even a carrier who's interested in providing or procuring a low emission transportation service, recognizing that those services come at a premium. It's difficult for those entities to connect directly and partner around decarbonization solutions in these complex and dynamic supply chains. And that's important uh, because I'll jump to the last bullet here. This stuff is expensive. When we talk about deep dark decarbonization of the transportation sector, the solutions that are out there, such as alternative fuels or the assets to use those alternative fuels are, are not cheap. The cost to abate CO2 emissions 
or CO2 equivalent emissions in freight transportation supply chain is relatively high per ton of abatement. And that's made worse by the fact that these are emissions intense operations that we're dealing with here. Even though uh, freight transportation can be comparatively efficient on a per ton or TEU or volume kilometer basis, moving a lot of stuff and heavy stuff long distance takes a lot of fuel, and that means a lot of emissions. So we saw this challenge, these kind of structural barriers to heavy transport decarbonization um, that we thought were, and we were hearing were, impeding the uptake of low emission transportation services in solutions. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So what, what is our role in this as SFC and what can we do to help? Mari Line outlined at the outset what we do as an organization as SFC um, and our work in assisting large multinationals to decarbonize their freight transportation footprints is steeped and had its origins in greenhouse gas emissions accounting. So the SFC team has deep expertise in greenhouse gas emissions accounting for freight transportation supply chains. And we saw that taking a market-based approach to greenhouse gas emissions accounting, that is a shift away from physical accounting, we'll talk a lot more about that later in the presentation, could be one way to address some of these barriers to decarbonization that I just mentioned and that were, uh, that were shown on the, on the other slide. So we saw that we had the tools and the expertise and were positioned to maybe help address these challenges to transport decarbonization through a market-based accounting framework. We have a long history in greenhouse gas emissions accounting for freight transportation. So we wanted to base this market-based accounting framework on other broadly accepted accounting principles, largely those captured in the Global Logistics Emissions Council framework, which as many as you know, um, served also as the foundation for the recently published ISO 14083 uh, Green, or greenhouse gas emissions accounting standard, the ISO standard for transport emissions accounting. We also wanted to do this multimodal work, uh, building on the concepts that we'd explored and outlined in the 2021 SAF insetting guidelines, but really to take those insetting guidelines for SAF and air transportation supply chains and develop a tool that would be flexible enough to address other modes of transportation and would also be flexible enough to allow for interventions that might not be just a drop-in replacement uh, liquid fuel like sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Mario Line. So one of the fundamental premises that really underlies this work is that even organizations who are really trying to do, quote unquote, the right thing and want to do the right thing, um, with the best of intentions are not likely to pay a premium for a low emission transportation service or solution if those organizations are not able to account for the emission profile of that service or solution in their greenhouse gas emissions footprint. Um, this stuff, as I said a couple of slides ago, is, is expensive decarbonization, deep decarbonization of heavy transport. And when I say deep decarbonization, I'm talking about not the low hanging fruit of efficiencies, which could actually be cost positive. But when I'm talking about shifting to a new propulsion source, a new energy source, a whole new type of transportation asset, the stuff is costly. Organizations aren't going to pay a premium for those costly low emission transportation services if they can't get the credit for doing so. And when I say get the credit for doing so, I mean, if they can't report on the greenhouse gas emission profile, the low emission transportation service or solution. To be able to report on the emission profile of a low emission transportation service or solution, an organization needs to know the profile. They need to know what they're paying for, what they're subsidizing uh, from a decarbonization perspective. And it's for that reason, really, that a chain of custody system served as the foundation for this accounting framework where we're trying to help shippers, carriers, and logistics service providers partner with each other around the deployment of low emission transportation services and solutions. It's so that organizations in these complex, dynamic, uh, large distributed transportation supply chains know and can track and can take credit for what they're paying a premium to enable. Next slide, please. Thank you. So chain of custody model is a foundation for all this accounting stuff. 
there are several chain of custody models. Um, there's an ISO standard that focuses just on chain of custody models uh, on its own. It's very engaging read. I encourage you to look at that. We're not gonna talk about all of those ISO standard chain of custody models. Um, long story short, we don't have time to go into it today. We explain in some detail in the market-based measures accounting framework that was released last week, and also in some detail in the SAF uh, insetting guidelines, why we as an organization and many of our uh, industry stakeholders ultimately decided that a book and claim chain of custody approach was the most appropriate chain of custody approach for tracking the emission profile of low emission transportation services and solutions with the ultimate goal of addressing those barriers to decarbonization that I discussed at the outset in mind. So we're going with a book and claim chain of custody model. If you take that as, as kind of just the foundation here, just a moment about what a book and claim chain of custody model is. The key point about book and claim is that it allows a complete virtual and physical separation of the environmental profile of a transportation service or solution and the physical transportation activity or the physical transportation, low emission transportation solution itself. So disconnection of the environmental profile of a service or solution from the physical solution or the physical service itself. What we're seeing here on, this, on the slides is, is a somewhat crude representation of what a book and claim chain of custody model looks like for a marine fuel distribution system. So we've got the conventional fuel providers on the top. They're refining conventional fuel. Center left here, we've got a low emission fuel provider. They're refining low emission uh, marine fuel. All that fuel is mixed together and goes off into a fuel distribution system where it is consumed by these, um, it happens to be ocean container carriers here on the right. The low emission fuel provider, however, is selling the emission profile of the low emission fuel that it's refined or produced to this ocean container carrier here at the bottom of the image. The ocean container carrier at the bottom of the image does not physically access and may never physically touch the actual low emission fuel molecules, but they are paying a premium for the emission profile of those molecules. Again, physical separation, of the low emission transportation service or low emission transportation solution, which in this case is a fuel from the organization that is claiming the profile of that service or solution. So um, if we go to the next slide, please, we can spice this up a bit and take it up a notch. What I was just talking about on that first slide is um, effectively the cookie cutter book and claim chain of custody approach for uh, a, a low emission fuel gets a little bit more interesting when we recognize that shippers and forwarders are not buying fuel, they're buying the emission profile of a transportation service. And so let's complicate this a bit by bringing in the shippers and forwarders and not just talk about the distribution of fuel through a marine fuel distribution network, but the distribution of the emission profile of a low emission fuel and the low emission transportation service generated from that fuel. So in this picture here, we got our low emission fuel provider in this little factory warehouse thing on the left. They're making some low emission fuel, delivering it to market. They are selling the emission profile or booking the emission profile of that fuel for claiming by what we have in the middle of the image here, that's an air carrier. It could be a road carrier, ocean carrier, the carrier type doesn't matter, the principle's the same. That carrier, is purchasing the emission profile of the low emission fuel from the solution provider and applying that emission profile in their own greenhouse gas emissions inventory. The carrier is also generating a low emission transportation service based on the emission profile of the low emission fuel. And they're selling the emission profile of that low emission service to here it could be either a uh, LSP logistic service provider as represented by that uh, little forklift or uh, directly to a shipper. Again, the logistic service provider and the shipper aren't really that interested in a fuel. A liquid fuel, low emissions or not, is of no value to them as a thing. What they're buying from a carrier is a transportation service. The carrier has taken the emission profile of the low emission fuel, 
generated a service based on that emission profile and sold the profile of that service to their customers in their transportation supply chain at the same time that the carrier is also reporting on the emission profile uh, for their own combustion emissions effectively in their greenhouse gas emissions inventory. We can make this even more interesting if we go to the next slide, please. So let's go back in time actually as we go forward in the slides to um, it would have been fall of 2020. Young Dan Smith comes to Smart Freight Center, fresh and energetic to engage on these decarbonization topics through, um, uh, through a, an accounting approach. And we're starting this SAF insetting guidelines, uh, uh, this SAF insetting guidelines uh, project. What we heard loud and clear from the solution providers that we were working with on that project is, look guys, we need to be able to sell the emission profile of our low emission product directly to freight shippers, or in that case to business travelers and to freight forwarders slash logistics service providers. The demand signal that we get from transportation operators, that is the carriers alone, simply is not enough of a demand signal for us to be able to finance these huge capital investments that are required to do stuff like building a sustainable aviation fuel plant. So with that being an underlying premise for part of the challenge we're trying to address is send enough of a signal for the solution providers to be able to finance major capital investments so that they can generate the solutions, we recognized that we needed to have a model that allowed for a separation of the emission profile that is going to a transport operator or a carrier and the emission profile that is going to the supply chain uh, of a transportation um, uh, supply chain, that is, that is uh, here the logistics service provider and or shipper. And we needed to be able to do that in a way that does not allow for the erroneous double counting of the emission profile of a certain batch of low emission solution in this case of fuel. So what we see here in this image is how the model works where there's this separation of the emission profile that is going to a carrier and the emission profile that is going into a transportation supply chain. Again, the warehouse represents a, a, a low emission solution provider who here will say is generating a low emission transportation fuel. They book what we call the emitter profile of that fuel separately from what we call the supply chain profile of the fuel. The emitter profile can be claimed directly by a freight transportation service provider that is a carrier who could report on that emitter profile in their own greenhouse gas emissions inventory. It's critical to recognize that the carrier in this application of the model does not get the rights to generate a low emission transportation service and pass on that emitter profile to their customers and their transportation supply chain. Why not? Because that supply chain profile has been claimed separately by in this diagram, a logistic service provider could also be a carrier, but this is really the most complex uh, representation because it flows through the supply chain. The logistics service provider is purchasing the supply chain profile of the solution, applying it in their own greenhouse gas emissions footprint, and then generating a low emission transportation service, which is their board, which is from there claimed rather by, in this case, a shipper who is contracted a transportation service from the logistics service provider. So we're about halfway through the, the time that we have with each other today. And before I go into the constraints that we've imposed on this model, I wanna stop for a minute and see if there are any questions or what questions there are about book and claim chain of custody approaches and the model for the, the flow of low emission transportation service profiles and low emission solution profiles through transportation supply chains, multi-party transportation supply chains before we move on. It looks like there's over a hundred people on this call and maybe it's ambitious, but it'd be nice if at least most of us felt pretty comfortable with these fundamental principles before we move into constraints on the model. So with that, um, let me change screens here. And um, we'll do this just audio. So if you have a question about what I just said, can you raise your hand? 
and then Ellen will help us by unmuting you and we can try and take a couple of questions here live. Just a few minutes to make sure we're well grounded in this content before we move on. Yeah, John, it looks like I see a question from you. Um, Ellen, are you willing to unmute John at KN? Hi, Dan. Thanks for the session. Um, what if the carrier is the LSP and wants to have the both emitter profile, supply chain profile? Sure. Yeah, so in that case, we could kind of go back to the previous slide, and this is um, it's a valid observation. This is an oversimplification of the roles of organizations in transportation supply chains. We recognize that LSPs may also, in some cases, operate transportation assets, in which case they are effectively a carrier. So if, thank you, Marjoline, if the LSP is the carrier, they're effectively wearing two hats and it would be this model. They would be buying what we call the bundled profile, both the supply chain profile and the emitter profile, applying the emitter profile, emitter profile to their greenhouse gas emissions inventory in their role as a carrier, and then also could be passing along that profile in their role um, as an LSP. Other questions from the group? Yes, Ron, go ahead, please. Let me see if I can unmute you, Ron. We can't hear you here. This might be teams trying to. Oh, geez. Ellen, can you help me out on this? Looks like Ron is, I can't, uh, I can only disable his, uh, his mic. Yeah, or maybe Ron, Ron best for you to unload, unmute, unmute yourself. yourself. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, well, Ron is sorting out the technical issues. Ellen and Quentin, are you seeing any themes that are coming up in the, um, in the um in the chat that are or in the question and answer function rather that are worth raising no, in, in no in, or, no written questions as yet dan i've just oh, okay uh, great just prompted okay. okay excellent so um in that case let's see we have uh one more person i see a hand here um i'm sorry is it odile yes it's me odile can you hear me yeah, excellent. What's on your mind, Odile? What's your question? Yes, uh, I, I have a question. That That's the, the following uh, slide that you showed, uh, page 10, uh, mean that uh, a shipper cannot directly book and claim um, a low emission profile from a solution provider? No, it, it doesn't. All this means is I had to select which images I was going to include in this presentation, and I picked this one because it was the most complex showing an LSP pushing along to a shipper um, if in the body of the accounting framework itself. Uh, we also show the model in which the shipper is direct claiming. So very short answer is not at all. The shipper can also directly uh, access the supply chain profile um, in the in the in the accounting framework uh, as written. OK, thank you. Sure. And then I'll take a uh, key so you get the final question and then we'll move back into the content here. Case, I think you might have to un uh, unmute yourself. Yes, here I am. Okay. Um yeah, on this on this slide actually. Mm -hmm. Uh what in the in the bottom half? So I understand the uh, supply chain um what is profile is then passed on but what mm -hmm. and then i see the call it the the black um icon the uh, uh l e t s is passed mm -hmm. on but what stays in the middle with the forklift truck nothing yeah right? so yeah no uh, that's not true it's a, and i'm glad you're asking so this is where we get into the complexities of overlapping greenhouse gas emissions uh, profiles. So I appreciate the question, Casey, because it allows us to spend a minute or two diving into that. If we look at, a, at the traditional 
transportation supply chain where a forwarder is purchasing a transportation service from a carrier on behalf of a shipper, the greenhouse gas emissions profile. Sorry, that say that forward, again. Say that last, yeah. say that last sure. question again. So in let's look at the traditional, a traditional cookie cutter model. You have a freight forwarder who is purchasing a transportation service on behalf of a shipper. So shipper goes to freight forward and says, hey, I got some cargo that I need to move. I need moved around and I'm not gonna deal with these carriers directly. Can you handle movement of my cargo for me? The freight forwarder in this model is not the transport operator. They go out and contract for a transportation service from a carrier. The emissions associated with that carrier's transport operations are purchase services. They're part of the supply chain of the freight forwarder, as well as the supply chain of the shipper. So what we're showing here is the freight forwarder is buying the, the emission profile of a low emission transportation service. They get to report on that in their own greenhouse gas emissions inventory because their footprint is impacted by the footprint of the carriers that they use. So too does the shipper get to report on the emission profile in their greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Effectively, the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of a carrier applies both to the footprint of the forwarder and the shipper. And so both the forwarder and the shipper get to realize the benefits of the low emission transportation solution that they've enabled and are paying a premium for. Okay, so with that, let's move, uh, let's jump back into the content and, um, and, and some of the constraints that we've Im imposed on this model. Um, so, Mari Liner, you wanted to jump us ahead to um, the 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 next slide. Okay, so we spent a lot of time talking about market-based measures for transport decarbonization, and the conclusion that we reached, and many other stakeholders reached, that the most appropriate model for accelerating transport decarbonization through market-based measure, voluntary market-based measure, is a book and claim chain of custody model. We also recognize that there are real risks associated with this approach. Namely, once you shift from physical accounting, greenhouse gas emissions footprint of this truck is um, the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of this shipper because this shipper has their freight on that specific truck. Once you shift from that physical accounting model to a market-based model where there's a separation of the environmental profile of low emission transportation service or solution from an actual transportation activity, things get complex and there's risks associated with, um, with a market-based model. We're fully aware of that. And it's for that reason that we imp imp implemented or we have imposed a series of constraints on the book and claim model outlined in the market based measure based measures accounting framework these constraints we really see as kind of guardrails um, to address some of the risks associated and their real risks associated with a shift from physical accounting to uh, to market based accounting so there are four constraints at a very high level they're imposed on the model in the, in the accounting framework. We have a constraint on additionality. There's a modal constraint, a vintage constraint, and then there are a series of controls that we've in, imposed tools and techniques to reduce the risk of, um, of double counting. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so the first constraint is this additionality uh, constraint. In very general terms, what this means is that um, a, if a low emission transportation service or solution was applied outside of an organization's contracted supply chain, that is, there's no physical link between the low emission transportation service or solution and the, uh, the claiming organization, then the low emission transportation service needs to be additional. What we mean when we say additional, that is not already required by regulation. And the reason that we've imposed this constraint is really goes back to the fundamentals of why we did all this work. We're not building a market-based measure uh, accounting framework just as a tool to kind of shuffle the costs, uh, regulatory compliance costs. 
uh, and allow disproportionate allocation of the emissions benefits associated with regulatory compliance actions. The idea that we're that we have here is to accelerate the voluntary uptake of low emission transportation services and solutions beyond regulatory requirements. And it's for that reason that we've imposed this additionality principle. Again, if there's not really a physical, if there's not a physical tie between a low emission transportation service or solution and the contracting or the claiming organization, then that low emission transportation service or solution needs to be uh, additional. Next slide, please. Okay, the second principle is the modal constraint principle. And in short, that means that um, low emission transportation services are, are bound by transportation mode. Reason for this principle is in this constraint is that decarbonization of heavy transport to decarbonize rather heavy transport across all modes, all modes of heavy transport need to be decarbonized. So if we look at an example of say an organization that has a greenhouse gas emissions footprint associated with uh, trucking and a greenhouse gas emissions footprint associated with aviation, the organization may be doing great stuff and electrifying their road fleet uh, or their contractor road fleet, really reducing their road transport greenhouse gas emissions, important things, but that stuff in and of itself is doing nothing to decarbonize air transportation. So the idea of the modal constraint is that that organization in this hypothetical example I've just outlined couldn't take the emission profile from their road decarbonization transfer, uh, road transportation decarbonization efforts and apply it to their air transport greenhouse gas emissions footprint. The modes uh, in the market-based measures accounting framework are bound by the modes that are defined in the GLEC framework. That's the Global Logistics Emissions Council framework. And there are currently six modes in the GLEC framework. We've got air, ocean, road, rail, uh, logistics sites, and inland waterways. So that's the modal constraint. Next, uh, next slide, please. Third principle is a vintage uh, um, is a vintage constraint, and I will not go into the details here because it can get a little tricky when you think of booking and claiming of services and solutions on top of each other and how the timelines for those may or may not layer or be related. It's explained in detail in the accounting framework. At a very high level, the idea here is that the emission profile of a low emission transportation service or solution doesn't last forever, or doesn't last forever, that is. So if you if you take a preposterous or uh, an exaggerated example, if I burned a low emission transportation fuel in my transportation assets 10 or 15 years ago, um, I can't go and apply that emission profile and push it along into my supply chain in, in this year's reporting period. So high level, the stuff doesn't last forever, and there's vintage requirements imposed in the accounting framework. Next slide, please. Fourth and final principle is really a bar or series of tools that help organizations significantly, we think, reduce the risk of erroneous double counting. Um, I, I've said this now a couple of times. We acknowledge that there are risks of double counting, erroneous double counting, once you shift from physical to market-based accounting approach. Actually, there are risks of erroneous double counting and physical accounting as well, but we get that it can be even more risky if you go to a market-based approach. So we devote a significant amount of content in the market-based measures accounting framework to outlining tools that control against erroneous double counting, meaning one or two or more companies erroneously claiming the emission profile of a low emission transportation service or solution. So that fourth principle is really a series of, um, or the application of arithmetic principles to greenhouse gas emissions accounting and disclosure principles to greenhouse gas emissions disclosure that explain how to do this stuff without erroneous double counting. And then on to the next slide here, please. Okay, so the final slide, just kind of summing things up. Uh, go back to where we started. 
We got these barriers to heavy freight transportation, large uh, decarbonization that is, large complex dynamic supply chains, emissions intense operations, high abatement costs. We think that accounting through a market-based approach is one way to address those barriers to transport decarbonization. The barriers in and of themselves are not uh, insurmountable. And that applying a market-based approach to greenhouse gas emissions accounting can accelerate the decarbonization of the transport sector by allowing organizations to more effectively partner with each other in sharing the cost premium of low emission transportation services and solutions, and also by extension, really expanding access to low emission transportation solutions and services to organizations who might not physically be able to, for example, get sustainable aviation fuel or get a low emission marine fuel at the ports where their vessels or the vessels that are moving their freight um, uh, bunker. In short, we got these issues, structural issues, um, constraints against uh, transport decarbonization, and we've developed an accounting tool, market-based accounting tool, based on a book and claim chain of custody approach that aims to address some of those structural barriers and accelerate the uh, decarbonization of, of heavy freight transportation supply chains. So with that, um, we've got time for more questions, and I will actually, I try and go into the chat or the Q&A function myself, but maybe uh, Quentin or Alan, are you seeing any questions that are recurring or themes that um, you think it's worth me addressing here live with the group? Sure, Dan. So we've we've had three written questions and they all really appear to be addressing the issue of double counting or correct allocation going from shipper to customer. Um, they were all written before you um, uh, uh, presented your double counting slide. So they, they may or may not have been addressed by, um, by what you said subsequently. But the, I, I think if you look across the three questions, they're effectively questioning whether or not there is an automatic pass through from carrier to shipper or whether the, the, the scope three attributes are only going to the uh, the customer who has um, who has purchased them and how you ensure that they don't go to two places at the same time. That's the yeah. gist of it. OK, no, thank you for that. That's fair. And this is something that we've grappled with a lot in the development of this project. So the question on is there an automatic pass through there? The, the short answer to that is no. So if we think back to uh, some of those cartoons we had before, there are two ways that this could be done. Uh, th there are two fundamental ways that this could be done. The emitter profile and the supply chain profile could be purchased from a low emission transportation solution provider bundled, or they could be purchased unbundled. If they're purchased bundled, they could be purchased by an LSP, a logistic service provider, who could then report on that profile on their greenhouse gas emissions footprint directly and pass it along their supply chain to their shipper customers who are willing to pay a premium to the logistic service provider for that low emission transportation service because the forwarder logistic service provider had to pay something to get the profile. That's kind of an unbundled booking. And the carrier pro or the um, uh, the correction, that is a bundled booking where the solution provider sells both the supply chain profile and the emitter profile together. Also, the second fundamental approach is an unbundled booking where the solution provider is selling the emitter profile to a carrier directly and is selling the supply chain profile to supply chain entities. In that case, there's not a direct uh, there's not a direct pass through. I'm going to go back to the bundled real quickly because the one situation in which a direct pass through could occur is that first image that we showed with the little airplane. The carrier in that case bought a bundled booking. They bought the both the supply chain profile and the emitter profile. They kept effectively the emitter profile for themselves and pass the supply chain profile in the form of the emission profile of a low emission transportation service onto their customers. 
So there's not an automatic pass through. There can be a separation of the emitter profile and the supply chain profile. There is the risk of double counting. There is the risk, I will say, of erroneous double counting because not all double counting is wrong or is incorrect. And we have implemented a series of controls from an arithmetic perspective to address that risk and a series of controls from a disclosure perspective, that is explaining how organizations can describe what they're transacting and where greenhouse gas emissions profile can be applied in the accounting framework to address those risks. Summing it up, there's double counting, not all of it's wrong. There's controls against the quote wrong double counting in the framework. And yes, it is complex. Yes, there are risks. And we think that those risks are outweighed by the benefits afforded by the flexibility provided through this type of market-based accounting framework that allows us to address those challenges to transport decarbonization that we started with. We've got a few questions, or not a few questions, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I guess we can go back to anybody who wants to raise their hand and, and open a verbal question. Otherwise, I'm happy to uh, turn it back to Mario Line for closing comments and then we can um, wrap it up. So maybe a moment or two for any hand raised questions uh, before we give you five or 10 minutes back to your afternoon, evening. Yeah, we have one, one question about additionality. Um, okay. Do you want to take a look in the, the Q&A? Okay, let me jump to that. And then I see uh, John's got a question in the in the verbal section. Stand by one, let me open up the Q&A. Can you help me with that, uh, Quentin? I'm not seeing it. The additionality question. Yeah, the question was, how is the additionality? How does additionality work uh, with, uh, I believe, let's and let's with ETS and ETS two? Okay, I'm not um, fully sure. I, I understand. I, I initially read it as if you were asking about let's. I think they might be asking about a regulatory. Um, oh, yes. the emission trading scheme. Oh, okay, yeah. got it. So. Okay, um, got it. Okay, so additionality. The short answer is. We, I, I cannot answer that question with you in detail right now. The reason for that is the additionality analysis is, con, is conducted on a case-by-case -case basis, and whether something is additional or not really depends on the details of the regulatory requirement. So what I would need to do with, um, I guess it looks like uh, this actually is a question from John. What we would need to do, John, is look at what requirements specifically you're talking about and what solution you have in mind and analyze on a case-by-case -case basis whether the solution you have in mind is required through the emission trading uh, uh, the emission trading scheme so the short answer is i don't know the answer to your question we've outlined in the accounting framework a way to conduct that analysis on a case-by-case -case basis and yes, that makes it difficult. It'd be nice if we could have just like a, a blanket answer to the question. We realized long ago, though, that there was there it was just not physically possible for us to provide an analysis of every potential regulatory requirement or existing regulatory requirement and how it applies to different players in the transportation supply chain. But the tools, the principles are outlined in the accounting framework on, on how to conduct that analysis. I've seen no further questions. Dan, or Alan, Dan, yes, sorry, go there's ahead. A, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question from Yannick, which has been asked twice. Um, I didn't okay. pass it through the first time because I didn't quite understand the way the question's phrased. And then he's asked it again. So, okay. so maybe um, they could have a go at uh, asking that verbally because otherwise it's not going to get answered. Okay, thanks. Yannick, are you willing to Raise your hand so Ellen can find you and unmute you, and we'll try it live here. We got a couple minutes left. 
Yes, hi, good evening. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes. Um, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, we have been discussing on this with, 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 with our own customers, uh, of course, and um, let's say we sell the profile of a low emission transport service uh, to, in the end, a shipper. Uh, we can claim that uh, reduction in their scope tree as well. Um, of course, what all of them are looking for is um, how can I take that into account in my product carbon footprint uh, and, and lower the, 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 the footprint there of, of their products um, and then use that as a benefit, of course, towards their own customers. Uh, and that's something I think that's one further step uh, compared to the slides that we've shown so far. Um, and how do you see that working? Yeah, so I agree with you, Yannick. It is one further step and we've received this. Um, um, question as well during the process of developing the accounting framework of what about carbon product footprinting and how does all of this stuff relate to um, regulation specifically in the EU or, or, or uh, forthcoming regulations in the EU about uh, labeling specific products. The short answer to the question is our scope for this project really took us up to the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and we did not go into the product realm. So I agree with you, particularly for for consumer products companies that that's that could be an important next step. The scope of this work was not focused on product carbon footprinting, but really on corporate uh, greenhouse gas emissions footprinting. Um, okay, well, seeing no further questions, Marjolein, I'll turn it back over to you for, for closing remarks. Th thank you all for your time and interest today. Thanks, thanks again for joining everyone. We really appreciate you all joining today. Um, if you have any further questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us via email info at smartfreecenter.org. Thank you so much and have a great rest yeah. of the day. There are there are four or five written questions we haven't got round to answering, so apologies. We've 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 tried to get through as many as we can and pass through and through verbally. We we can't manage everything in the in this time slot. So as uh, as Marilyn says, do follow up by email. Thanks all. Have a good day.